Hello everybody, welcome to the TriStar Gym channel. Say it ain't so, <laughs> Liver King on steroids. Who would have figured that out? Which one of you out there had IQ level 2000 and was able to put two and two together and figure out the great mystery of how Liver King f <laughs> built his physique? I, wanna I went on a rant a few podcasts ago, maybe five, ten podcasts ago, talking about how he's obviously on steroids and I had people write me and tell me, no, coach. It's not necessarily true that he's on steroids. And I'm just thinking to myself, these people writing, they're sweet. They're kind. They have such pure souls, but they're incredibly gullible and naive about training. They're incredibly inexperienced. The man is obviously on steroids. It's embarrassing to me that when he says he's not on steroids it was embarrassing to me i found it like so naive like it's such a insult to our human intelligence it's like i find it so dumb you know i find it so dumb so insulting so ridiculous so absurd so hilarious that he thinks we're so dumb and he he knows we know he knows we know but there's a lot of people out there they just and it's not their fault. They have no experience with this kind of stuff. They have no experience with what it takes to build a physique like that. And he's exploiting their night their he's exploiting the naive population out there that will give him his money. I heard he claimed he makes makes a hundred million dollars a year. I I I highly doubt he made a hundred million dollars. Even total lifetime sales, I highly doubt it. It's not impossible. The supplement game is like this. The ones that make it, make it big. The ones that don't make it, you never heard of them. I actually have a friend who got into the uh, supplement business. My first sponsor on this channel, he, he uh, uh, Quest Nutrition, guys. Quest Nutrition. Um, the founder of Quest Nutrition, Tom Bilieu, he actually... He was a big fan of mine, flew down to Montreal to meet me, etc. Got me to do this channel. Actually, I want to say a big thank you to Tom Bilieu. I, this channel would have never existed if it wasn't for a man named Tom Bilieu who founded Quest Nutrition. He co-founded Quest Nutrition. That that year that he founded Quest Nutrition, there was a thousand other bars came out. Just not, not there was a thousand bars on the market. That year, there was about another new thousand bars hitting the market. He was one out of a thousand new bars on the market. And his company grew to a billion-dollar company. It's a multi-billion-dollar company. It's massive. Guys, you, you all know Quest. If you know Quest bars, you know what I'm talking about. He did it. And I know guys in the supplement business. You can make it huge. And $100 million is nothing to Quest. Now, I don't think, I don't think um, Liver King ever made it anywhere near that level. Personally, I, I don't even know about his... Uh, supplements i don't think i've ever seen them anywhere i wouldn't recognize them if you showed it to me i wouldn't recognize the brand now, of course quest i've seen it everywhere it's literally everywhere from walmart to the gas station to any supplement store they all carry quest around the first world countries all carry quest bars okay he claims i heard it, i heard he said he claimed that 100 million or something crazy like that no i don't think he ever made that much but he's made He's made bank, okay? He's made bank. He's made, he makes millions a month. He's up there. He's high up there. He has nine, ancest nine ancestral, whatchamacallits to live by, tenants to live by. But he forgets one ancestral tenant, the synthetic steroid tenant. That <laughs> Only those of you with IQ 2000, level 2000, were able to figure that out. Connect the dots. Um... Guys, he's obviously on steroids. It's just it's such a joke. You know why? I'll tell you why it's such a joke. There are so many other guys out there like him. He, he's just one of many. He's just one of many. There's a new career path nowadays. Just get on steroids. Take HGH. Take human growth hormone. Uh, get really, really trim. Diet a little. Do some exercise. Start an Instagram account and bank. Money, money all the way through. You're just rich. How much do you know about training? Very little. How much do you know about fitness? Not much. You just know the basic. Let the hormones do the work. Let the gullible people send you their money. Guys, it's a bit embarrassing. I'm happy he got exploited because it, it, building your physique, guys, it's consistency over it. intensity, training on a regular basis, eating correctly. That's it. There is no other secret. There's proper form, exercise selection. There's a lot to know about nutrition, guys. There's a lot to know about fitness and nutrition. It's an ocean. It never ends. However, there are no shortcuts 
known to man other than steroids, chemical, all that stuff, guys. Putting that moment, the guy has as much muscle as a professional bodybuilder. There are no professional bodybuilders that look like him that are not on steroids. There's not one. There is natural bodybuilding, which is a year natural or five years natural. And I don't even think those guys are natural. How would they know they're natural? You, like they're going to test them randomly? No, they're probably going to do a testing here. And I don't even know how they do the testing, but it's definitely not USADA level testing. It's definitely not, we're knocking on your door, we're flying to wherever you are in the world. It's not this level of UFC testing. You, 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 the UFC testing is a whole other level. And still guys cheat. And still guys cheat. Anyways, guys, I just found it funny that <laughs> when he came out with his apology, saying that he was doing it for uh, men who are suicidal, men who are submissive, Men who are, I don't know what, this, that, this, that and I, oh, that's why I was doing it. I wanted to show them that you can do it. You could be like a man. He's not wrong. Look, there is there is a wave of effeminate, effeminate men. Men have been really there there has been a change. Why why do we, why do why does why do philosophers say this? You know, he's not a philosopher. Oliver King's not a philosopher. I have a degree in philosophy, but I can tell you many philosophers will tell you this. Why? Because if we look back at the, the men in the 1950s, men in the 1920s, men in 19... We notice patterns. We notice there's a change. We look at men in the year 100, the year 500, the year 7. What was different in their culture? Okay, there's such a difference. Yes, yes. And slowly, slowly, as time passes by, men and women are kind of gelling more into more and more and more into one. More and more, okay? Now... Guys, you know I specialized in Greek philosophy. I, I will tell you something. When Plato said we should educate women, when he told the Greeks even women should be educated, which he was right, okay, I would agree with him, it blew the Greeks' minds. They're like, what? You want the women now to philosophize and think? Fast forward to our day, it's common knowledge. It's, it's self-evident that women should be educated. It's self-evident. Of course, you should go to school. What else are you going to do? Like, There's nothing more important than education, but... We've come a long way. Men have come a long way. Men have come a long way. Like the society, culture has come a long way. And more and more, we're gelling more and more. We're gelling more and more. We went from something that we consider today to be very obvious to it was mind-blowing once upon a time. Okay, and I don't have to go all the way back to ancient Greece to tell you that to a lot of societies didn't want to educate their women. I don't have to go that far. I'm just saying that as I was reading Plato and he was suggesting to his fellow men that women should be educated, he got a lot of pushback and you know, he wondered why waste the time. And of course, life was much shorter then. Uh, acad academies didn't exist. Okay, Plato, he founded the academy. He's the master of the academy. And it's not even, even wasn't even really con considered a university. However, it was still an academy. The man was looking into the future. And, you know, a future... I don't want to paint him in a, in a rosy glow. Okay? You know, he had a lot of crazy ideas as well. Uh, maybe one day we'll get into that because he had a lot of things. He's the father of eugenics. I mean, he, he Plato was a he, Plato's a very complicated guy. We'll talk about him, I'm sure, at length in this uh, channel every so often. However, I don't want to paint him as a rosy in a rosy tainted glasses. Now he had he had a lot of crazy ideas as well. He was also very, very controversial. Okay, he said a lot of nice things and a lot of things. Many of you would object to, and of course, I don't want to mention them right now because I would be giving them out of context. He said certain things within a context that will probably, uh, many people will find objective, but uh, uh, objectable. However, if you knew, understood the context, which I'm not going to get into now because it would take us on a long tangent, it's more understandable. Not understandable, but more understandable. Okay, guys, Liver King. Yes, he's on steroids. We all knew it. Everybody knew it. Still, a lot of people bought his supplements, man. The guy claims he made 100 mil. I find it incredibly um, impressive that people are that naive. Guys, I'm going to take comments and questions on Liver King. I want to see, has anybody out there ever bought his supplements? Anybody? <clears throat> Coach, are you on roids or nah? That's from Rainbow the God. Well, I want to thank you, first of all, for that accusation. I find it very compliment complimentary. I haven't been accused of that as often as I'd like. Uh, no, but I'm 100% natty, of course. Liver King is as natural as Gordon Ryan. That's from All Player Thirty One. Um, listen, everybody, there's a lot of steroids in sports, but even more in jujitsu than MMA. Even more in jujitsu. And you know, when you get to the higher levels, almost all the competitors are on it. However, I find it very objectable 
when I see local tournaments and, and somebody's on it. The guy's in the blue belt division. He's on steroids. He's wrestling some young kid and he's like crunching his head on the mat. It's like, how insecure are you? Like, you really need steroids to f compete at this level? I understand when there's big money on the line and there's, even though I, I condone it, I don't think it's good, but I understand the pressure. I understand why guys cave and do it because they're dirt broke. They put their whole life on this one sport and if they don't make it, guess what? Nobody cares and what, what else do they have to fall back on? Nothing. So they, they yield, they bend to, under the pressure and all of a sudden they're eating the devil's lettuce, they're drinking, they're nibbling, they're taking choking down pills and now all of a sudden their career takes a boost and that encourages his competitor, everybody, and it becomes a race to who can augment themselves chemically the most. And some flirt with death. Some flirt with you. They're shortening their lives. No doubt about this. No doubt about this. They look healthy, but they're not. They look healthy and they're not. And, and I'll tell you one thing. I always mistrust anybody's jujitsu when they're on steroids. If I train with somebody and I know they're on steroids, a lot of guys will admit it. And it, it, I always tell people, it's none of my business. If somebody wants to do steroids, it's none of my business. However, if they ask me, should I do it? I always say no. I always put health first, okay? Health first. And also, if you're on steroids, I can respect your jiu-jitsu. I can understand that you understand the moves and you move well. And you're, But I don't trust your jiu-jitsu. Why? Because... How do I know what part of it is strength, chemical enhancement, and or is it your jiu-jitsu? I used to train once upon a time. I don't want to name names, but I used to train under a black belt that was admittedly on steroids. And his techniques wouldn't work for me. And every time he gave me advice in the back of my mind, I would, I would, I would have a major doubt. Like I would, I would seek knowledge else, elsewhere. Why? Because this one black belt couldn't get his moves to work when he was tired. Or he was wrestling a bigger guy. And I realized that he's using so much strength. He thinks his jiu-jitsu is good, but it's only good against guys who are natural, not, uh, not augmented like him. Now, there are men who are on steroids and their technique is impeccable. Those guys are going to be very difficult to stop. Now, some people tell me, this is a very naive response, okay, in my opinion, incredibly naive. Some people tell me, coach, taking steroids won't make you a good at jiu-jitsu. And I say, okay, no, taking steroids doesn't make you good at jiu-jitsu. If you take somebody who doesn't train in jiu-jitsu and you give him steroids, guess what? He's not good at jiu-jitsu. However, they don't call them performing, enhancing. Go look at the dictionary. What is the word enhancing? And what is it enhancing? Performance. So the predicate is referring to the subject, which is performance. It's enhancing performance. It's, an enha it's a performance-enhancing drug. Why do they call it that? Because... If you perform jiu-jitsu daily, it'll enhance your performance in jiu-jitsu. It's that simple, okay? So if you take steroids, you're not good at jiu-jitsu, but if you take steroids and you practice jiu-jitsu, it'll enhance the level of skill you acquire. Guys, check out lighthouse.world. One of my students, believe this or not, is creating the Google for the metaverse. And guys, he's in the news. He's raised like millions of dollars, $7 million. This guy's he's the... Who's the guy who invented Google? What was his name? Let me Google the man who invented Google. Google inventor. Who invented Google? Larry Page, Sergey Brin. Google was founded on September 4th, 1998 by Larry Page. Okay, Larry Page. Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Guys, the Larry Page and Sergey Brin of the metaverse actually trains at my gym. Check out lighthouse.world. If you're going to search the metaverse, check out lighthouse.world. Guys, I'm going to put a video in the description later on. Check it out for more details on it. He made a video explaining to you guys what it is, but check out lighthouse.world. Guys, you're going to hear the word lighthouse.world in the future all over the place. It's going to be like the word Google. It's incredible. He trains with me. He's a purple belt. He's a black belt in judo, incredible purple belt, and he's a brilliant button pusher. He's a genius button pusher. The guy's running the Google of Metaverse, a button-pushing master. Maybe I should become his student, learn button-pushing. But he's the button-pushing master of the world, of the Metaverse world. Check out lighthouse.world. I put it down there. What can I say, guys? I mean, I hope you mark Zuckerberg's the whole thing and um, we get to be a part of it. 
Okay, guys, what else do we got here? Liver King got busted. All of you out there with even IQ of 0 0.001 could figure that out. Anybody out there who trains could have figured that out. <laughs> Paul Saladino is the real Liver King. Joe Rogan said it. That's from Chris Pogge. Guys, Paul Saladino, I think, yes, he is natural. If he tells me he's natural, I'll believe him. I think you can be that lean, that ripped, and he's natural. Yeah, I believe it. He eats well. He. But when you're overly muscular, when your abs are sticking out like eyeballs, this is not possible with the amount of exercise science we have, the knowledge we have. It is not possible. We have never, it can be possible. It's not logically impossible. It can happen. One day we might discover that, hey, if you mix honey with this, I don't know what natural product, and if you stand on your head and you blink your eyes, it might make your abs grow that much. Maybe it's possible. There's not, it's not logically impossible. Believe me, guys, I have, a, I have a degree in epistemology. I'm telling you, it's not logically impossible. It's just that we don't know. The combination. Nobody knows it, except if you're going to use chemicals. Now, yes, we know. Guys, what's Liver King? What, Liver King also has a degree. What does he have a degree in? Anybody out there? No, put it in the chat. I want to see. Don't Google it. Don't you dare Google it. Just put it in the chat. What does he have a degree in? He has a degree in bio, biological chemistry. He has a degree in chemistry. I remember one time I was trying to, you know, after I went on a rant that people were writing me, no, he's not, he's not. So I was like, let me Google. Let me Google. Maybe I'm, let me Google. And I Googled that he was saying that he eats like a pound of liver a day. You cannot eat a pound of liver a day. You'll poison yourself. You'll have an overdose of vitamin A. And he said, like, I know this already. You can only eat a few ounces of liver a day. Guys, I love to eat liver. I think liver is good for you. Lebanese, we eat liver. We eat raw liver. I've been eating raw liver since I'm a young kid. I don't look like liver king. We all, all Lebanese eat raw liver. It's nothing new to us. We eat raw meat. We eat raw liver and we love it. It's a staple food in our cuisine. You go to any Lebanese restaurant, you ask for kibbeh, kaftane, they're going to give you raw meat. Okay, Many places you eat beef tartare, salmon tartare. People eat raw meat. He's not the first guy to eat raw meat. He didn't invent the eating of raw meat. Why doesn't everybody else look like him? Well, he says, I eat a pound a day because I understand the chemistry, so it's okay for me, but don't do it for you. What does understanding the chemistry mean? have anything to do with you ingesting a pound of like he's just saying the most illogical irrational things and people just believe him it's a, it's it's quite it's quite it's quite amazing that people believe him. i think they just really really want to believe him. okay what else we got here therapeutic trt has been great for me i'm in my 30s that's from posa piz posa you know what I'm, I'm not against that if you're in your 30s though i think you're way too young like i think i'm gonna do it when i'm 50 or 50 plus I might do it to keep my body healthy not to for performance enhancing and I'm scared to do it because then I'm going to question my own jujitsu I'm going to be like you know my own martial arts now it's improved but is it because of the chemicals like now one, that's why I would never touch steroids one is for my health and two I'm a trainer how can I teach my students what to do how to how to execute technique if I'm on the chemical they're not it won't work for them, and I won't know. I'll be. I'll, I will never know what it is to be like them. So I never touch the stuff. I never was even ever tempted. And I always tell my students, health first, you know, because I'm not going to tell you to take something that might shorten your life for many, many years. So, Posa, I want to tell you, you might feel good right now. But as you get older, God forbid, you have cancer cells, you have some kind of liver issue, you have whatever it may be, it can enhance the problem. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story, a real quick story about a guy who was an admitted PED user in my gym. He used to tell the world, used to tell us all. He was on it, didn't hide it, didn't care. He was in his 50s. He was shredded, ripped, lean. One day, unfortunately, he starts getting the hiccups. The hiccups turned out to he had a cyst on his liver. That liver, six months later, killed him. Why? He was on hormones. That whatever thing he had on his liver grew exponentially because okay, so i don't want to scare you or anything but just be careful you know these kind of things your doctor prescribes them to you because if you die 30 years from now you can't pin it on him you can't pin it on him he, he what who are you to say that it was on him these guys the far the pharmaceutical companies i know you can get your doctors now you got your doctor in your back pocket you know him he's your friend he's gonna write you whatever you want they're just it's money it's it's a billion dollar industry Hey, coach, what are your thoughts on Bang Muay Thai? Apologies I've, if you've answered this before. That's from Easy Men. Guys, I've trained with Bang years ago. He's a great trainer. He's one of the top minds of Muay Thai ever. 
I highly recommend him. Highly, highly recommend him. But guys, I'm just taking questions on Liver King right now. Let's talk about Liver King. Then we're going to talk about Ankalev and judging reaching level 100. The judging now has reached level 100. Uh, what are your thoughts on medical medium? I'm not sure what medical medium means. Well, let me Google that. Medical medium. What do you mean by that? Medical medium. Medical medium, alleged, communi uh, alleged communication with a spirit. Guys, look at me. Let me say something. I think there's a lot of shysters out there. Okay, this guy, medical medium, he's talking with spirits and he'll give you medical advice. Guys, I believe in other dimensions. I believe in in spirits. I believe in all sorts of things. However, I do believe that there's countless shysters out there, countless pretenders. I haven't researched this guy. I haven't looked into it. But believe me, I, I'll tell you something. I believe there there are countless dimensions, countless. There are things out there that are far beyond our imagination and they exist. We're just we're we're just a microbe. We are just a tiny microbe. We are just a speck of dust. What you think to be the universe is nothing but a speck of dust. That's how I see the world. Kind of like think about the smallest tiniest little germ that lives on your skin. To it my desk here is a universe. But it doesn't know that this desk is just a, it's just a, a speck of dust itself. And the earth to him would be unimaginable, the size of the earth. And that's just a, that's just a small little tiny insignificant element in the universe. We thought the stars out there were plentiful. And then astronomers figured out those aren't stars. Those are entire galaxies. Those are entire, you know, originally when we were human minds, when they were calculating the stars, how much, how many stars were in this space, what they thought were stars were actually galaxies. We're always being surprised by the vastness of the universe. Now, when we talk about the universe, they're, they're talking about something called the known universe. They refer to it as the universe, but it's really the known universe. And then they went from universe to multiverse. It's a whole history. It's an incredible history. And how they came to deduce the multiverse, your whole universe, what we thought just 100 years ago was the universe, is actually just another tiny little, they say, they say I love how one, one, one scientist put it, he said, think of the foam on the sea, just a little tiny little bubble, in the foam. you know, the foam of the sea just never ends, it's, it's, it's uncountable, foam on the sea, the, all the bubbles, they're uncountable, uh, Earth, uh, our, our, not Earth, sorry, our universe is just that little bubble there. So, guys, I believe in so many things, but these guys are just shysters. They're just shysters. They're just trying to, uh, you know, get your money. Look, he would have to show me an incredible amount of evidence for me to uh, believe him. <clears throat> Ronnie Coleman was natty till 30. That's from, oh, really? I've heard that. Actually, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I believe these guys. You know, I'd have to look at his history. I'd have to. I'm not a big Ronnie Coleman fan. I don't know much about him. I've seen pictures of the guy. He looks uh, steroided out, uh, out of his mind. Was he was he natural till thirty? Look, he could have been a genetic freak. I've seen guys who are genetic freak that I believe are natural. That they look kind of like the Liver King, but they're nowhere near the level of Liver King. But you know what I mean by that? I mean they're high up there. They're above. They're above and beyond the average person. And I would tell you that Ronnie Coleman maybe is a liar. Okay, so don't be so naive. Look, I like to always ask. Okay, if you're so ripped, if you're so genetically wonderful, show me pictures of your evolution. Show me when you were 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. If there's, a, if, if there's an, a leap in muscle, if the guy put on 30 pounds of muscle after being muscular, put on 30 pounds of muscle, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that's not possible. Okay. Unless he discovers something we don't know or he's using PDs. So if he, if he discovers something we don't know, publish it. Let us test it. Let's do a clinical test. Why wouldn't Liver King want to clinically test his nine ancestral, uh, what's your McCallit's elements? Why wouldn't he want to do it? Why wouldn't he want to take, I would, if I was Liver King and I had that formula, I would take 10 regular Joes and I would document it. These guys are living with me, they're training with me, they're eating like me, and look at their evolution. He didn't do it. You know why he didn't do it? Because he cannot do it. He cannot do it. He can't get a third group to independently study 
his me- his methods. That's why I have a high respect for uh, what's his name, the, uh, the Ice Man. What's it, what is what they call him again? The guy with the breathing exercises. I'm forgetting his name. He went in a lab. He did a clinical test. I believe the guy's authentic. I believe the guy's legitimate. I'm forgetting his name now. I don't know why. But you guys know who I'm talking about. He has like 20 plus world records. He's famous for uh, withstanding incredibly low temperatures, etc. PhD in cowardice. That's from Sheldon Schofield. I'm assuming. Oh, he has a. That was to my question. What does he have? What degree does <laughs> Liver King have? And the reply was a PhD in cowardice. What are your thoughts on medical medium? Do you think Patty the Body is a path- pathological liar? Guys, I'll get back to that later. That's going to be in judging 100, level 100. Do you think men yearn for guidance or approval so they can seek personalities like Liver King, Andrew Tate? Not comparing the two, but the fact that they gain so much popularity. That's from Alex Barron. Alex, I think you're right. Young men need a mentor. I was young once upon a time and I wanted a mentor and I found one and I still, to my age, I always look for mentors. Guys, when I wanted to study jujitsu, I found a mentor. When I wanted to find, study Muay Thai, I found a mentor. When I wanted to study philosophy, I wanted I found a mentor. Finding a mentor is fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that. It's it's warp speed. It's learning in warp speed. If you have a mentor, you're learning in warp speed. However, a lot of people out there are liars, shysters, scammers. And I'm happy to help you guys. I'm happy to point them out to you as best I can. Okay. Um, if they don't want to be tested, don't give them any trust. It's test, measure, retest. You make a claim, we have to test it. We have to cross-examine it. Put it under the light. How many times have I made a claim here and I asked anybody out there want to challenge me on this claim? Come on my podcast. All you have to do be all you have to do is be a subject matter expert. That's it. I'll bring you on my podcast and cross-examine me. And if I'm in the wrong, I will change my opinion. There is nothing wrong with changing your opinion. If you're in the wrong and somebody shows you're in the wrong, you should change your opinion. There should be no shame in that. Actually, if somebody proves proves to you you're in the wrong and you change your opinion, I grow in admiration for you. I will grow in admiration. I'm like, you know what? That guy's honest. I like that about him. I feel an admiration for you. I feel some positive emotion towards you. I don't know why... In, certain cultures being wrong is insulting to oneself you have to be careful with this it's a very poisonous type of uh, attitude it's good to be a mentor it's good to be to it's good to have a role model or a uh, as you put it uh, oh, let's see. to seek uh, expertise and all that and look Andrew Tate, I think, he's a reaction to feminism. Okay, he's a reaction to feminism. Every time you have a movement, you're gonna have a reaction to that movement. Okay, now feminism today is growing in crazy popularity. It's it's out of control almost. Like like if you think about it, just look ten years ago, feminism was on the rise, but it wasn't this powerful. Feminism is more powerful than ever. Every year, it's gaining in popularity and power and et cetera, et cetera. And I think he's a reaction to it. Okay. Um, it's not it's not abnormal that when you have a movement, you're gonna have a reaction to that movement. Okay, so there's action, reaction, action, reaction, action, reaction. That's just life, you know. There's yin and yang. The pendulum swings. If a if a people are very conservative, over time they'll become very liberal, and when they're very liberal, over time they'll become very conservative. It's not only that the grass is always greener on the other side, but if you live a very conservative life, all of a sudden it's so tempting to do something out of your world. I remember I was watching Breaking Amish. Guys, this show is, I found it to be hilarious. 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 I must have laughed out loud maybe a hundred times watching the show. It's about a group of Amish kids and how would you get cameras in Amish land? Those are questions I was asking myself, but just suspend, <laughs> suspend, suspend your critical thinking just for enjoyment's sake. You know, it's the weekend. You're watching this. Uh, you're with the wife. I'm with the wife. I'm with my friends and family. We're watching. We're having fun here. You know, it's just entertainment now. Yeah, I'm gonna have to suspend my critical thinking for a second here and just kind of enjoy the show. Get get pulled into the fantasy. But yes, Amish, they live without electricity. They're very religious. They don't have any pleasures in life. They 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 want to forsake any type of ex, you know excessive pleasures. And 
if you don't know about Amish people, it's very common that the youth sneak off the compounds and they go party and they do things. They wear English clothes, as they call it, like non-Amish clothes. They call it English clothes. And they're not completely uh, averse to the modern world. Okay, they, they, They're they in Pennsylvania. They're not far from New York. It's not uncommon that they go and they party up in the middle of the night and then they run back into their uh, houses, sneak in, mom and dad don't know. and But they played it like these kids have never seen the outside world and they are legitimately Amish. I, I, truly, I truly believe they're legitimately Amish. However, they've seen the outside world. Okay, So it's a bit of an exaggeration, but nonetheless, nonetheless, listen to the story, okay? The Amish starts with, uh, they're, they're showing you this family and this young guy, he's like, hey, I want to go to New York. I want to live it up. I want to see the world, etc. Now, in the Bible, in, the, in the, the Jewish Bible, the Torah, okay, if your son disobeys you, Listen to this. If your son disobeys you, you're supposed to, uh, how should I say? Um, um, how should I say in a nice way? Uh, you're supposed to kill him. <laughs> okay. If your son disobeys the father, you it's within the father's right to kill him, right? Now, the father doesn't do it, obviously. He's living in the modern world. He's not going to off his son. He's not going to murk his own son. The cameras are rolling. It's like, you know what, son? If you want to go to the outside world, that's your business. Go ahead. Now, the son goes out into the outside world, and he tells people he's going to go, and so people get excited, and all of a sudden, he rounds up a couple of people. So now there are three or four. They go to the world. They go to the they go to New York. They have an adventure. They're starting to become famous. He comes back to the Amish lands, and he tells his mom, look, I'm going to become English. I'm done with this Amish world. Now, more people follow him. His sister follows him. Then... The brother follows him, and all of a sudden, the brother's at a bachelor party, and he's getting a lap dance, and all, all, all those sins of the world now. They found all the sins of the world. And the father is now, like, really upset now. Not only is the father really upset, but the wife, at one point, goes to go see her son in New York, and she ends up finding herself <laughs> getting in the mix, and she finds herself in a dance club all of a sudden, partying and drinking and having fun on camera. And then she comes back to her husband. Her husband is fuming now. Now his entire home, it started with his son, then his other son, then his daughter, then even his wife is in the club. Of course, this is reality TV. You know, I'm sure they're like, the producer's getting a hand in. You know, he's trying to set up these scenes. I get it. I've been on, I've been on reality TV. Like I've been, you know, in uh, countdowns and all. I've done all that. Like, you know, producers try to set up things. This is entertainment, don't forget. But whatever, we're suspending belief here. We're enjoying our show. And... The mother now is in the club. The mother is now Amish. And of course, because she has a camera crew around her, people are going <laughs> to indulge her, right? They're going to you know, buy her dream. If the guy stuck, <laughs> the guy broke the rule of the Bible. Remember, the Bible had warned him, if your son disobeys you, he didn't follow the rules, guys. He didn't follow the rules. Look what happened. Chain reaction. Chain reaction. All of a sudden, <laughs> his Amish wife is in the club. What can I say, guys? I didn't get to watch the rest of it, but I'm assuming uh, the whole uh, Amish clan uh, fell apart. <clears throat> okay, what are your thoughts here? What are your thoughts for us? The real liver king. Yes, I am the real liver king. Man said Merc of his son. Yes. Ye. <laughs> Talk about the Lebanese culture in Mexico. That's from All Yellow. You know, I, I know I have a friend of mine who married a Mexican woman. And I have dear friends of mine that are Mexican that are from Las Vegas, but I've never been to Mexico, a place I really wish to visit. But they were telling me there's a major problem with the law now. Like the, the cartel is basically the law. I heard there's about 70 murders a day in Mexico. 70 murders a day and no investigation on these murders. No investigation, which is pretty scary. So uh, I, I, do wish to Mex I do wish to visit Mexico, but I don't know much about the Lebanese community in Mexico. Morocco winning the World Cup. That's from Tanner A. Guys, Marrakesh, Morocco. I'm with you guys 100%. Guys, I love Morocco. I've been to Morocco. I love Morocco. I will visit Morocco. I'll maybe one day live in Morocco. I'll maybe one day become a Moroccan citizen. That would be something I would love. And I can tell you something. I couldn't be happier that the Moroccans won against Portugal. And I hope... Inshallah, they make it all the way to the World Cup and win the whole thing. This would be a beautiful thing. Inshallah, I hope. Moroccans winning the World Cup. Talk about the Lebanese culture in Mexico. Talk about uh, which show SPO leave ASAP. 
Okay, guys, what else was there? Ankalev. What a fight. What a fight. What a fight. Guys, we're talking about Ankalev now. Round one, he won. I, th I thought he won round one. He landed the better shots. All three judges give round one to Blahovic. I completely disagree. Round two, Blahovic kicks out the legs of Ankalev. Ankalev's knee gives out. I'm writing him off. I'm there. I look, I picked Ankalev to win. I'm like, okay, Ankalev, unlikely to make it. Unlikely to make it to the fifth round because that leg it looks really bad. It looks like an ACL tear, maybe LCL if he's lucky. But he tore something. The fight goes on. Round three, Ankalev turns it up, comes back, looking. I, I, I think I give I give round three to round two to Blahovic. Anyways, I can't remember. I had a three to one for Ankalev, but Ankalev got his second knee kicked out from underneath him, and I was like, "Wow!" I remember. Sorry, I give I gave two rounds. I gave two to two. Excuse me. It was two to two going into the fifth, and Ankalev wins the fifth. No doubt, he won the fifth. No doubt. But what blew my mind is his other leg, leg gave out. Blahovich kicks out the other leg. Ankalev switches stance and gets his other leg kicked out of him. And I'm freaking out. I'm thinking the guy has no knees to live to 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 move on. Guys, that is so bad. You, you cannot generate power. How on earth did he score those double legs? I don't know. The guy had two bad knees. His knees were hang, hanging by a thread. He pulled it out of the fire. That championship belt was in the fire. It was red hot. He went in there and he grabbed it. He scolded his hands. He pulled it out. It was his. And the judges took it away from him. He won. In my opinion, he's the interim world champion. In my opinion, in my heart of hearts, in my mind, that man is the interim world champion. He beat a legitimate UFC champion, ex-UFC champion, and he deserves to be the interim world champion. Judging incompetence doesn't take that away. In my book, it doesn't take that away. They're completely, utterly, completely, 100% wrong. They're untrained to do this job. I blame whoever put them in that position, whoever gave them that power. You can't put somebody to judge MMA who doesn't understand what's going on. It's sad. It's not in the UFC's control. It's in the government's control. Ankalev had two broken wheels and still won it. That was one of the best performances ever in a championship fight, ever. There have been many. But if I had to put 100, 100 top best performances in MMA, in world championship MMA fights, okay, maybe 150, let's top, top 50. I'll put this performance. The guy had both wheels kicked out from underneath him and he came back to win. Now, here's a question. Why did both his knees give out? Now, one knee, you could say, you could speculate, maybe he had a pre-existing condition. Maybe he tweaked his knee three, four weeks ago or three, four months ago and it's been bothering him and it's chronic and Blahovic just so happened to kick him because the one, the first kick, kick, he kicked him in the shin, if I remember correctly. The shockwave goes up the knee, click, the weakest part of the body, the weakest part of the chain is going to break. That was his knee. His knee gives out. When both your knees give out, guys, let me tell you something. As a trainer, I'll tell you something. Something is wrong in the practice room. He is doing something to damage his knees. Something mechanically incorrect. He's doing it over and over again. He has an overuse injury. He's created over, uh, two high levels of inflammation. There are many possibilities on why this happened, but it has to do with the practice room. Highly, unli highly unlikely it's a genetic factor. Highly unlikely. It's something they're doing in the practice room. Something is wrong. Guys, why do I always tell you guys, do a minimal amount of knees over toes when you're doing conditioning. Never use load and never use high, high reps. Why? Because all MMA combat sports, it's all knees over toes, knees over toes. When you sprint, when you jump, when you kick, when you tackle, when you pass the guard, when you sweep, it's all knee over toe action. Don't go and do it in the weight, weight room. Give your chance for your joints to come. Uh, give them a chance. Give them Give that movement a rest. Let your body recover. When you're in the conditioning room, your job is to work the stretch shortening cycle, low impact plyometrics. That's one of the most important elements, not the complete and only. It's not about doing the moves that 
are specific to my sport. It's about doing, recreating the speed of my sport in the practice room. I'm going to say that again, okay? It's not specific adaptation to impose the man. It's not the set principle only. That's one factor. A more important factor is the S, S, C, the stretch shortening cycle. We're trying to replicate the speed of our sport without taxing the joints. And that's going to give us power, speed, endurance, and it's power, speed, and endurance is safety. Ankalev, in my opinion, is doing something wrong in the practice room. I'm not sure what it is. I'm not in a practice room with him. He had a, he overworked both his knees. His knees were in a recovery, a state of recovery. And when he got kicked, they broke apart. If he only injured one knee, I wouldn't say this. But the fact that he injured both knees tells me he's doing something wrong in the back practice room. Because one knee could be a freak accident. Guys, one day I'm going to be on this podcast telling you about how I broke my knee in a freak accident. Maybe I got leg locked. Maybe I got tackled in a weird way. Maybe I was sparring and somebody got tackled. My my The guy sparring next to me tackled tackle one of his partner and crash in my knee. I've seen this in my own eyes. Two guys sparring, <laughs> two groups sparring next to another. One guy tackles the other and they fall into, you know, Rashad Evans towards ACL like that, actually. Two guys wrestling on the side of the mat. They ran, ran into him and crashed into him. That's why in the gym, we always talk about staying in our zones. We don't, anyways. One knee, that's possible. Two knees, something's wrong in the practice room. You're not following the rules. You have improper form. You're not using a margin of safety, etc. Guys, I'm not going to go through it again. Check out strong and stable knees. Keep your knees for life. Don't let your knees break out from underneath you. Ankalev is, my opinion, the inter-world champion. He fought brilliantly. The judging made me sick, man. Honestly, it made me sick. Made me very sad for him. Now, I know a lot of you guys are talking about Paddy Pillman. No, I, I agree, guys. He didn't win that fight. Gord, Flash Gordon won that fight. He fought brilliantly. Guys, I picked Paddy Pimblet to win. I was wrong. Flash Gordon did it, man. He beat him. He won round one. He won round two. He won round three. He won all three rounds, and then they gave it to Pimblet. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. Okay, guys, what else we got here? You mentioned on JRE that joints can last our entire life. How and where do I learn about this? That's from New Gun Guy. New Gun Guy, check out jujuclub.com. Pick up the Strong and Stable Life for Life a series. It's all in there, my friend. All put in concise, quick to understand form. And Strong and Stable Knees now comes with the PDF, guys. It's been released. Also released, um, Side Control Escapes Made Easy. And Seated Guard Made Easy. Basics, Advanced Basics, Volume 9, Volume... 10 is out. Volume 9 and 10 is out. And also, very shortly, I'm going to be releasing Strong and Stable Running. It's going to probably be the best series I've ever released. It's going to get you in the greatest shape of your life. This I promise you. Uncle have got lucky with the draw after losing first, third rounds, but I still think he's the best in the division. No, no, no. Uncle did not lose that fight. He won that fight. He won round five. And... It's very charitable to give Blahovich round one. Very charitable. I don't think he won round one. I think Ankalev won round one. He won round, uh, I think it was three and four. I can't remember which other rounds I gave him. Anyways, it was, it was. no, sorry. I gave him three or four, I should say. And the fifth. He won three rounds, no doubt. Coach, what do you think of alcohol? You do not drink? No, I do not drink. That's from peanuts. No, I think alcohol is the worst thing you could put in your body. The absolute worst thing you could put in your body. It's completely unhealthy. And honestly, I don't know why people drink. I think it has to do with using it as a social, social lubricant. You want to feel good. You want to run away from your troubles. And if you drink alcohol, you can behave in a certain way that you normally wouldn't. And your inhibitions can drop and you can kind of yield to your most base desires. You can act like a fool and people kind of forgive you for it. I think it's very psychological. I think it's extremely psychological. I think it's it's nonstop bombarding us with media, 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 marketing, 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 marketing. And then, okay, yeah, I'll drink this poison. It's it's good. I like it. You can. It's so much. There's so much conditioning behind it. Now, in ancient in the ancient world, they drank wine because it was safer than water. 
There was a time and place where it made sense to drink alcohol. It was safer than water. Drinking water was poison. Water was poison, and alcohol would actually increase your life lifespan. Now, don't forget, ancient beers had very little alcohol. Very, very little alcohol, like maybe 2 or 3%. But it was safer than water. Wine was safer than water. Nowadays, you know, water is safer and safe to drink, and it's healthy. Alcohol, I find, if you look at communities that, if you look at, if you if you want to hold a community down, if you want to hold a community down, give them broken homes, alcohol, and drugs. You'll keep them down for generation after generation. You'll find that they're poor generation after generation after generation after generation. Now, if they don't drink, if they don't have broken homes, and they don't do drugs, it won't be long before they're your equals. Two, three generations, all of a sudden, they're rich, they're famous, they're... They're in politics, they're in university, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're respectable, they've, they've, amassed, they've amassed inheritance over the years, they become rich and strong, and now they're in politics and they're your rivals, or they're your peers, or they're your equals. However, if you want to keep them down, um, entice them with alcohol, drugs, and this other thing that leads to a lot of broken homes which I, I don't want to say the word because a lot of people are going to get upset with me over time you'll keep them down forever generation after his father was poor and his son is poor and then his grandson is also poor and his great grandson will also be poor and his great great grandson will also be uneducated and also poor it's a really simple formula I think it's a way to keep people down and of course the rich and mighty drink alcohol but they do it in a very different way they do it in a very very different way uh, you know, they, they drink fine, uh, I don't know what, and they kind of drink to a certain level. But when you're dirt broke and every, all of your finances go into supporting your, your alcoholic um, and your, your alcoholic dependency, et cetera, you're drinking to run away from life. You, have, you don't have any other pleasures than this alcohol. That's the only thing you have. Well, that's a good way to keep people down. <clears throat> Did you mean Zina, coach? No, I, I didn't. No, not, not Zina. Abu Khalil. No, I didn't mean zina. Zina is a major factor, but another word, another word that uh, I can't say. Is it possible to turn one's life around in just two years? My friend is 38 and worried about turning 40. He has wasted most of his life. No career slash wife. That's from Bez, Bez 11. Bez, your friend is in a very uh, common scenario. It's called a midlife crisis. Yes, you can turn your life in two years. You can. It's not easy, but you can. Wake up every day. And write down your goal. Every day, wake up, wake up, write down your goal. Write it down. If you do that every day, if the f if you wake up and the first thing you think about is your goal, you're going to make it. Now, if you wake up in the morning and you drink your tea and you have your breakfast and you wonder what you're going to wear today and you wonder who you should call and should you go to the mall or should you play video games or yeah, I'll get to my goals later. You're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. If every day you wake up and you take a pen in your hand or you type it on your, every day you type your goal in. You have a long notepad of all, just your goal rewritten over and over. That means you wake up in the morning and that's you're focused. And if the first thing you do today, you wake up, is a step forward towards that goal. And then before you go to bed at night, you're thinking about what's your next step. to. If you're constantly stepping towards that goal, and thinking about that goal, you'll get there. If your first things first every day, you put things in order. What am I doing today? Well, I'm I'm gonna do these things that take me close to my goal, and then I'll go grocery shopping, and then I'll see if I have some leisure time, and then I'll decide if I can, uh, you know, go shopping or wh whatever it may be. But first, I have to cater to the goal, the needs of my goal. If that's the kind of attitude you had, you're gonna make it. Now, you might not reach that specific goal, but you're going to reach success. You're going to reach success. If you have this type of attitude, this type of mind, you will be successful. It's inevitable, your success. I would say it's inevitable. However, there are degrees to success and there are varieties of success, but you'll be successful. However, if this is not your way of thinking, I have no idea what can happen to you. Uh, Salam, coach. Please read Pimp, the story of my life. You must use the glossary. The slang in the 40s is gibberish now. He wrote it while in prison. Help me understand what real misogyny is. Okay, let me look that up. Pimp, the story of my life. Interesting. Now, 
Let me tell you guys something, okay? In Arabic, in Arabic, if I call you an akrut, if I say akrut, it's me calling you a pimp. In Arabic, in our, our culture, it's an insult. I'm insulting you. If my father calls me an akrut, like I'm a bad guy, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a scum of the earth. He's not happy with me. In the West, if I call you pimp, I'm praising you. I'm praising you. It's a complete opposite. What's up, pimp? Pimp, that means you have women, you have money coming to you, you're in control, you're slapping you know what, you're you're a man, you're you, we've 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 raised you in status now. We're not demeaning you, no no no. We're raising you in status. See in the East, Middle Eastern world, if we call you pimp, we're insulting you. You're a bad person. You're disliked. <laughs> So when you told me, pimp, I don't know if this guy is loved or hated. I'm assuming story of my life, an official autobiography of Robert Beck. I don't know. I, honestly, it's not going to... So he's, he's, he's a famous pimp and he talks to you about his life. I'm really, honestly, not really interested in reading this book. I got to be honest with you. To me, I just find it ridiculous. Why would somebody want to read the, about the life of a pimp? I don't know why. Guys, you put me in the room with a pimp a real pimp i might slap him i might slap him i might injure him so i don't know why i would want to pay him money to read his story like I coach i do boxing and i'm about to compete started to self-defense i got street fights and usually after a couple of punches it's over so my muay thai really better and why uh, <laughs> that's from ali 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 don't fight in the street man just find a nice mma gym get it out of your system please don't fight in the street i didn't really answer your question you got to work on your english a little bit my brother but please don't fight in the street that's not it's not good okay really don't do that Hey, Coach, what do you think of JR versus Tyra Tulo? JR versus Tyra Tulo. Who's JR? Let's see. JR versus... Oh, Gordon Ryan. You're talking about Gordon Ryan. No, it doesn't make any sense. Gordon Ryan's way too big. He'll just crush him. Listen, I love the Rotulo brothers. They're great. Pound for pound, they're incredible. But we're talking about a whole different animal here. Gordon Ryan, pff, that's not... That's not. That's not. That's why I didn't, even, I didn't realize you're talking about Gordon Ryan. I wouldn't think they... I know they went back and forth. I don't think that match will ever happen. I hope not because I don't. Is it booked? Because you know Gordon's done a couple of crazy matches, but I doubt he would ever. I I don't I don't I don't see anybody putting up money for that. I don't think Gordon would do it for fun. <clears throat> Coach, what do you think about Dana White's comments on on Kalayev and Patty Patty's fights? I don't know actually. I did not. Uh, I did not read his comments. Oh, that comment, JR versus Tyro Tulo, that's from Anthony Levesque, one of my students. <laughs> Anthony, what's up? I hope that match is not really signed because it's just going to be a beating. Gordon is just going to crush him. Hey, for us, any system you have for your fighters to defend from low kicks? That's from Light. Yeah, of course. Just basic Muay Thai. Absolutely. Um, SPO, I, J, I think the best thing you can do is get closer to God. I know... It's not an easy pill to swallow. Not sure what that was about. Uh, <coughs> pardon me, gentlemen. Guys, I've been fighting a cold. I've been out for two weeks. I haven't podcasted. I think it's been two weeks. I was out with a cold. That's why I'm drinking this tea, guys. This thing won't let me go. I'm still coughing. It's been two weeks. Man, this, this cold this year, it's been really bad. I had a hard time shaking it. But I can't stop working. I keep working. I keep doing. I have. To, I always have so many things to do. Maybe and then I was like, oh, I have to. I have to maybe just try to rest. But still, too many projects, too many things going on. I can never, really, truly rest. All right, what else we got here? Weed better than alcohol. That's from Rainbow. Listen, I'll tell you something. I wouldn't want to be in a room full of drunk human beings. I'd rather be in a room full of stoned human beings. Because <laughs> drunk human beings are very violent. And I don't know why. But when I see drunk people, I think right away I feel threatened. If I see somebody who's high, I don't really feel threatened. I feel like, oh, they're going to be more relaxed. They're not going to do anything aggressive. I used to be a security guard, so I've seen drunk people. When they get drunk, they want to fight. They get courageous. They get crazy. They get riled up. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a chemical thing or what it may be. But drunk people scare me a little because I feel like this guy's going to do something stupid and... 
it could lead to a fight. And it happens all the time, right? So it's an old cliche. <coughs> Excuse me, gentlemen. Pardon me. Okay, here. Everyone, coach is too is here. All right, what else are you here? They say everyone's immunity got weaker after lockdowns. That's some good. Yes, I believe that. Yeah, I really believe it. Honestly, there's a huge wave of kids getting sick, etc. I think it was the greater of two evils. I think what we did, which I can't talk about, but anyways, I won't say anything. Do you think it's a bad idea raising kids in the West? That's from Mo. Listen, here's what I think. Listen, guys, Mo is short, for sure short for Muhammad. <laughs> He's like, hey, I'm raising my kids in the West, you know, like. Just like basic internet is going to show them all sorts of haram things, you know. Haram for us is like taking you off the path, you know. Generally, guys, if you want to know what haram and halal, halal is like what's good. Haram is what's bad. But everything that's haram for us that's bad is if you think about it, if you look at the system, it's really because it destroys the nuclear family, okay. Anything that harms the nuclear family is forbidden. We're all about thriving. We're the fastest growing people in the world. We have the most successful nuclear family in the world. Our whole thing is about nuclear family. Father, mother, biological children. That's the whole, like, the whole system is funneling us in this path, okay? Which is a great thing. Now, he, my friend is asking me, look, I'm in the West now. Is my path going to click, 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 click? Is going to, is going to, yeah, it's a major risk. Yeah, because in liberal countries, Western countries, there's very little nuclear family. Divorce rates are high, et cetera. There's a lot, but it's all, in my opinion, it's all about education. Me, I teach my kids everything. I sit them down. We talk. I analyze their thinking process. You have to become a philosopher. You have to become a... Uh, you have to understand the world around you and why something is good and why something is bad. I always tell my kids, you can either have pleasure now or pleasure later. Pleasure now is easy, but it costs you the pleasure later. Pleasure in the future is always greater. Always greater. Delaying gratification is the number one indicator for success. Did you guys know that? Did you guys ever see that uh, that um, marshmallow test? A psychologist, he created a marshmallow test, and then he followed the, those human beings for 20 years. And he found that the marshmallow test was a test that was the greatest indicator. He basically gives a kid a marshmallow, and he tells him, look, you can eat this marshmallow now, or if you wait two minutes to eat it, I'll give you a second marshmallow. The kids who waited two minutes, and for a kid holding a marshmallow in his hand for two minutes is making him crazy. The kids who could wait two minutes, could delay gratification, were the most successful. Every other metric fell short to this one metric. It makes total sense to me. Delaying gratification is huge. So I will tell you, it's all about dialogue, understanding, logic, study. Understand why things are right and wrong, why things are good and bad, what, they do, what do they bring us. If you bring your thinking to a higher level... You can educate your children, and your children can um, sidestep all these pitfalls. I like to think I have. I've sidestepped many a pitfall that many of my peers fell head first in, which I kind of saw coming. I always try to kind of warn people in the nicest way, and many times they fall head first, and then they regret it deeply. They regret it deeply, and, you know, it's it's not about being smart. It's not about being smart. It's about being interested in what is the best way to live like you actually think this question you know socrates said something beautifully he said an unexamined life is not worth living he thought that if you don't think about what's the best way to live if you don't even think about it if you don't try to do it it's your worth is not your life is not worth living you might think you have this great formula but you don't you're just you're just digging a hole you're just gonna you're gonna hit a wall soon you're gonna feel all all that pain that all that pleasure you felt in the past it's gonna be f turned into pain times 10 and you're going to feel it. You don't think you're going to... Look at the, the past, guys. If you guys were here five minutes ago, somebody just wrote me a message. Coach, my friend's 30, 38. Can he change his life in two years? He's having major regrets. He's wasted his entire life. Now, when he was 20, if I would have told him, hey, don't don't waste your life. Oh, no, man, I'm having fun. Don't worry. Now he's 40. He's turning 40. All that time he had in the past is now translated into pain to him. He now sees it as a waste when, when he was in his 20s. If I told him he's wasting his time, he would probably dismiss me. Why? Because to him, he's, it's, it's easy enjoyment. 
So yes, gentlemen, we're all trying to set ourselves up for the future. Don't shoot yourselves in the foot. This is very important. Think about what is the best way to live. Philosophize about it. Think really, really deeply about it so you can have a satisfactory life. All right, guys, a couple of bunch of hurt people hurt people. Pimps are disgusting, but their nature is insightful about men and the connection to mother, to their mother. Pimps hate their moms. No kidding, Hassan. Hassan, every man has a relationship, a very sacred relationship with their mother. That's the first thing psychologists do. If a guy, he, he, he abuses his wife, the first thing a psychologist is going to wonder, what's your relationship like with your mother? If it's good, he's going to say, well, this woman doesn't live up to your mother's standards. If it's bad, he's going to say, look, that's a surrogate to your mother. You want to re get revenge on your mother, so you're beating the hell out of your wife. <laughs> he's always going to tie it back to the mother. You're absolutely 100% right. What is your relationship with your mother? Now, if you ask me, I would jump in front of a speeding bullet. If, my, if it was coming towards my mother, I would jump in front of a speeding bullet for my mother. Why? Well, my mother raised me. She, I felt love. The only pure love. You know, the Mexicans have a beautiful saying. And one of my Me Mexican friend of mine taught me this saying. I can't remember how it, how it goes again. But he said, look, it translates. The Spanish translates to a mother's love or nothing. A mother's love or nothing. What does that mean? A mother's love. There's nothing higher than a mother's love. That's the greatest experience. You know, when you were a baby, once upon a time, you felt your mother's love. It doesn't matter what you did. What you, it, it was unconditional. We want that or we want nothing. Why do they want? Because there's nothing else that's good. That's the only, that's the, that's the highest pleasure a human being had once upon a time. Okay. So all of life is like going back to that kind of thing. You know, I understand that sentiment. I don't think it's ultimately true or not, but I understand that sentiment. I feel bad for men who grew up without that. I feel really bad because I had that. So sometimes I, you know, I, I have friends, they have no relationship with their parents, no relationship with their mother. Their mother's almost a stranger. When they say hello to each other in passing, hello, hello, stranger. We will have this pleasant interaction for a moment once a year and then adios. It's a very sad uh, thing to observe because they never had that bond. Why? It was broken somehow, some way. And generally speaking, modern life has done that. Why? Because our moms now are working women. They're very busy. They have their careers. They're going to hire a nanny to take care of us. And the nanny's going to be kind of our surrogate mother. But then the nanny changes every few years. So who filled that void? Nobody really. So I grew up as an adult. I have attachment issues, et cetera, et cetera. All sorts of possible ailments come to rise from this. Um, if your mother was promiscuous, you might become a pimp. Why? Because if the woman that was most, if you, let's say for instance, okay, you were born and let's do a thought experiment. Person A is born and his mother was, she was wearing a white dress. She had a traditional wedding and she was a virgin. The whole town knew it and she, her whole life was waiting to marry this one guy and like, they had this special relationship. They had you the most pure couple in the world. And you'd feel very special. You'd be like, wow, wow. They did all that for me. Wow. Like they came together just because they knew they were going to create this family and me and my brothers and my sisters. And they took care of us th through our whole life. And they, they nurtured us and they, they gave us every advantage and they pushed us forward to be successful. And wow, you'd, you'd be like, what a mind blow. This is all subconscious, of course. Psychology, psychology I can tell you, this is all subconscious. Now, let's do scenario B. Your mother had a drunken night. She doesn't even know who your father is. It could be a possibility of these several, three, four, five different men. You know, that month she had a uh, adventurous month, let's call it. And then when you ask her, who's my dad? She's like, well, it could be any of these guys. Actually, I don't even know who they are, where they live, etc. You'd be like, what? You'd be like, wow. I grew up. I'm a, I was a mistake. I was a, a current. I don't guys, please, if, if, if you were born in this, wait, don't take no offense. I'm just trying to contrast the two scenarios. And I'm asking you, what would it do to your psyche? That's my question, okay? I don't know what it would do to your psyche. Personally, I'm talking about in general. How would a person's psyche react? 
I'm asking you to do a thought experiment. Please don't take any judgment upon this. Okay, I'm not trying to judge. I'm just telling you my personal experience. I was on the other way. Like I was my whole my parents came together to have a family. That's the reason why they came together. And it was very traditional, let's call it. Okay. Now the other side, let's say, how would your psychology psychology develop, you think? You find out your mom was promiscuous. She was known for being promiscuous. You were a, f a byproduct of a drunken night. And she continued to be promiscuous as she was uh, getting older. And all of a sudden, she became 40. Guys didn't want her no more. She's dating total losers. Because that's the only thing she can get now. Because at the end, the more guys used her. Guys, I'm, I'm giving you a scenario here, okay? The more guys used her, the more they disliked her. The more they looked, they lost respect for her, etc. I don't want to get into uh, Schopenhauer and I'm, I'm just giving you guys in a nutshell. Now you feel, hey, you know what? All women are like this. This is, women are just like this. So you might start to despise women as a whole. Why? Because you see a woman, she's not trustworthy. She's going to betray me because she's going to sleep with some other guy later. Even if I have a child with her, she'll have a child with another guy. Like I'm just another, she's not she's not uh, attached or loyal, etc. You know, because generally speaking, on the other end, scenario A, the woman grows attached, she's loyal, she's dedicated. Um, she's here for the family as a whole. While the other mother in scenario B, well, she's just living her most uh, base desires. Whatever desire she has, she's thirsty, she drinks, she's hungry, she eats, she's horny, she has sex. This guy, that guy, it doesn't matter. My base desires are in control. Hence, the reason why we look down on those people, I'm not going to get into too much psychology, but the reason why psychology will tell you, look, people like that are looked down upon because that's how we are when we're children. When we're children, if you're cold, you're going to cry. If you're thirsty, you're going to cry. You're going to reach, you're going to eat, you're going to drink. Your infant mind is not going to share. It just wants to eat. Some people never grow out of this phase. In psychology, they'll tell you, some people get stuck in this phase. Me, 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 I, I, I. As you get older, you realize, hey, there are other people and other people are hungry and other people are thirsty. So you start to mirror their desires and needs and you start to think, hey, I have empathy. You grow and psych your psyche grows up the ladder. This is actually admirable. It's beautiful. It's something uh, virtuous. The other person who just succumbs to their base desires is bad for the community as a whole. Because if we all succumb to base desires, we get out competed by nations or civilizations that cooperate, think of one another, have virtues. Guys, I don't want to get into the Republic, but this is the Republic written by Plato. He goes into all this. He goes into all this. Long story short, people who stay stuck in their early stages of development psychologically speaking they're looked down upon because they didn't achieve the next level like if you think of homer simpson he's funny why because he's stuck in in a very early stage in life and he's an adult but he's an adult so it's kind of like this contradiction he acts like a child he's the human id what's the id freud taught us about the id the ego and the super ego the id is your base desires you're angry you lash out <sighs> you lash out you you're happy or you something's funny you laugh uncontrollably <sighs> you don't control yourself you <laughs> you satisfy every desire it's cute when you're a child it's embarrassing when you're an adult because you didn't evolve that's why people who succumb to their base desires over and over again are usually humiliated or looked down upon now if you're a pimp what Freud would tell you is your role model, he invented the term role model, guys. The, the term role model comes from Freud. It's not that old. Freud speculated that, look, when a young boy is born, he identifies with his father. His father's a male, he's a male. And therefore, that's the model of a male. He's my role model. I'm going to behave like him. My mother uh, likes pink. My father likes blue. Okay, these are the cultural norms that he's going to develop under. Okay, we're talking about Freud's uh, time in Freud's time if your role model for a woman is a promiscuous person who's succumbs to their base desires who's untrustworthy etc you're going to start seeing all women like that 
according to Freud. So, yeah, the guy's, he's a pimp because he probably hates his mother. No doubt about it. I know I went on a bit of a rant, but you guys should know this, the basics of psychology. I think it's, it's quite important. Okay, guys, what else do we got here? I agree with whatever I said. All right, guys, let's see. Did I miss any super chats? Uh, Coach, what do you think your game plan would be against, for Arnold against uh, Volkanovski? Volk seems unbeatable in that weight class, especially with the distance management. That's from Hatcher. Hatcher, I can't talk about <laughs> fighters I train. You know, if you don't know, I never talk about fighters I train because I feel it to be very unfair uh, to discuss their careers on this channel because I'll be giving inside information. Do you think... Uh, Coach, can you an analyze what Slavjov Sizek says about wisdom? He claims he is opposed to wisdom. Is what he says true about wisdom? Hassan, if Zizek says he's opposed to wisdom, is he being wise? Is that wise? If he's not being wise, then you should discard his information. If he is being wise, he's in a self-defeating position. You can't argue against wisdom or logic. It's a paradox. It's a self-defeating claim. If he's wise, then he's using wisdom. His position is self-defeating. He's claiming to be wise. He's, 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 think, he's claiming to be saying something wise. Wise, by definition, means good. By definition, it means good. If Isaac's saying it's not wise, he's by definition telling you his, his position is wrong. If he's saying it's right, it's self-defeating. He's claiming to be doing something that he thinks is wrong. His position is absurd. I don't even have to look any further, but I would love to entertain it. But I, I, I don't feel like I need, need to bother reading his material. Do you think Muhammad Peace Babanam is the better example? Uh, yes. Um, well, hey, coach, tell me you us a crazy story when you were working uh, as a secure... <laughs> Anthony, that was in the universe a long, long time ago. Hurt people, hurt people, pimps are... Uh, we read that one already. Uh, definitely this convo needs beer. <laughs> I'm just drinking tea, man. Guys, this is we talked about MMA already, okay? Now it's AMA. Ask me anything. We talked about AMA. We talked about Liver King. Today I started with Liver King. Then we talked about Ankalev. We talked about Patty Piblet, the judging. And now we're doing AMA. Okay? Anything goes in AMA. For us, I'm thinking about <laughs> about trying to have three girlfriends at once. Is that wrong in your, <laughs> in your opinion? This is That's from Peanuts. Well, Peanuts, you might want to change your name, first thing of all. Ah. <sighs> Narcissism is not wanting a boring CH. I don't know what CH means. <laughs> Disagree. Communism gets beat by capitalism every day. And capitalism is fundamental, foundationally about the right of self-preservation. That's from Quinn Baker. Guys, is it true that capitalism always outcompetes communism? Is it true? I think so. I think it's quite true. Name me one, one thing that was scientifically revolutionary or technologically revolutionary or academically revolutionary that came out of a communist country. I personally, to my knowledge, can't think of one thing. Not one. I might be wrong. But I personally cannot think of one thing. Now, China is a communist country. And they're technologically incredibly advanced. But in my opinion, that's probably because everybody's sending them all their IP. All Everything's made in China. So how do you make it in China? Well, you got to give the guy your IP. You got to give him your intellectual property. You got you to show it. Then they're going to knock you off. Then they're going to have the collective. The entire world is sending us their IP. And of course, they're going to become technologically more advanced. Now, they're academically also more advanced. Yes. But where is the cutting edge revolutionary breakthroughs the vast majority of them have come from comp uh, 
capitalist countries. And there's a reason for that. However, is it sustainable? I don't think it is. I think in the future you will have breakthroughs in communist countries, revolutionary breakthroughs in science, technology, etc. I think it happens more in capitalism, guys, and I sympathize with capitalism. I think I like conscious capitalism, like capitalism, but it's capped a little, you know, so people aren't dying in the street. It's kind of like, are we street fighting here or are we doing MMA? I like MMA. I don't like street fighting. Street fighting, it's too gorish. Let, let's, let's, let's put on gloves. Let's have a medical test. Let's have judges. Let's not kill the other guy, but let's find out who's the best. Okay, that I'm, I'm, I'm much more sympathetic to that position, but I don't like the all-out street fight. And I feel like sometimes some capitalist states, it's too much of a street fight. Again, that's a subjective position. It is not a, it's not a, it's, 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 an, it's, an, it's, an, it's a judgment. It's an opinion. How is Aristotle so knowledgeable? Is this God given or can it be developed? Much love. That's from Anthony, my boy. Um, thank you for that. Uh listen, I will I really believe every civilization learned from another civilization, and that civilization learned from another civilization, etc. The Greeks learned from the Egyptians, in my opinion. I think there's plenty of evidence for that. However, we don't have anything further, really, than the Greeks. We have some, okay, we have uh, hieroglyphics, etc., but we don't have journals, we don't have notes, we don't have books from the ancient world further than the Greeks. The Greeks is really as far back as we can go. Now, there are fragments of more ancient stuff, but it's not really that developed. Okay, we don't have that much of it. Why? Papyrus disintegrates. Knowledge is lost. However, there are countless references in Greek writings that allow us to understand that it came from somewhere else. But yet Aristotle was very special, nonetheless. You know, I, one time I heard <laughs> Lawrence Krauss, was it Lawrence Krauss, was that, that physicist, he was saying negative things about Aristotle. I was like, man, that's, an, that's absurd. Guys, yeah, that's absurd. I've studied the life of Aristotle quite thoroughly. I can tell you something. Lawrence Krauss has no idea what he's talking about. As great of a scientist he may be, I'm sure he's really popular and famous and good, but he has nowhere near the level of accolades as Aristotle. Okay, Aristotle literally wrote the book on logic. Everything that science rests upon has a lot to do with Aristotle. He figured it out. He put it on paper. Like He really literally gave us logic he formalized it he made it a formal lesson he gave us a square of opposition he taught us the laws of logic he taught us how the difference between deductive and inductive logic he taught us so much that i don't even think lawrence krauss could even understand some basic elements of epistemology. The thing, the basic things that Aristotle taught us about logic, I don't think even Loris Krauss has mastered them, to be honest with you. So I don't think, if he, even if you read Aristotle, I don't think he could appreciate it unless he took the time to study it. Now, he definitely has the IQ points. He definitely has the horsepower. And he has a mind. He has a great mind. If you could study physics, you could study philosophy, no doubt. But what I'm saying is that he would probably dismiss it before he even ever understood it. And it has more to do with his dogmatism than it has to do with his intelligence because he's a very intelligent guy we can't take that away from him absolutely not but nonetheless he's uninformed he's uninformed and prejudiced towards aristotle because he was making nasty comments to, uh, towards aristotle but i was thinking to myself that is completely wrong guys if, if there was no aristotle there probably wouldn't be no galileo if there was no galileo there would probably be no sir isaac newton if there was no sir isaac newton you probably wouldn't have einstein now you'll have einstein but he wouldn't be at that level you'd have isaac newton but Isaac Newton would, would have never reached those levels you would have Galileo, but Galileo was testing Aristotle's theories and he found some to be right and some to be wrong. One giant rests on the shoulders of the other, as they say. Okay, so, I mean, it's just Aristotle, I think, also rested on other giants is what I'm trying to say. Coach, now you talked about people who succumb to their primitive basic desires and disadvantages of being so. Could you tell us how not to be like them how do you fight your impulse? That's from a man with a Russian name. Uh, that's a very good question. You know, um, listen, it's all practice. It's all 
delaying gratification for a greater good, a greater goal. What is your goal? You want something in life? Man, don't you notice everything in life, every goal has to do with su suppressing your base desires? Socrates likened it to uh, a chariot. The horseman holds the reins and you have these wild horses. The wild horses are your senses. They want to drag you here, drag you there, drag... And you're the charioteer. The charioteer has to rein them in. He has to control them. He has to subjugate them. He has to subdue them. He has to dominate them. This is a very important um, human experience. You have to overcome this. Like you have to come over. You have to overcome your basic desire for sex, hunger, thirst, anger, jealousy, envy, all the sins. You cannot have virtue, which is the opposite of sin, without overcoming your base desires. We all do it to a certain extent, because if you didn't, you'd be an animal, you'd be in jail. But it takes practice. Have a goal, have a vision of your life, and guess what? To get to that vision, you're going to have to succumb those, you're going to have to subdue those desires. Guys, I can tell you how many times I wake up and I feel like I don't want to go to the work, I don't want to go to the gym, I don't want to, I don't, but it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter how I feel. I wake up, no matter how I feel, unless I'm physically sick or something, I know already what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to put in the time. I'm going to put in the energy. I'm going to focus. It's just daily reaching for your goals. And the pain of reaching your goals is because you have to overcome your most base desires. <clears throat> guys I'm not giving any Arabic lessons today my Arabic's not that great I'm definitely not in a position to give Arabic lessons but it's <laughs> liver king sleeps on a wooden bed does this help in any way that's from AMS no I don't think it does in any way whatsoever I don't think you should sleep on a wooden bed I've never heard or read or of any study that says that's beneficial Guys, the man's on PEDs, okay? <laughs> so eating a wooden bed, jumping up on one leg, eating a raw, raw testicle, and uh, hopping up and down and blinking your eye 30 to 50 times. It's not going to give you the physique of Liver King. Guys, one time I was at PFL, and one of the fighters had just fought, walked out of the cage. I was walking out behind him. Liver King was there. Liver King. And the guys were like, oh, let's go take a picture with him. I'm like, I don't want to take a picture with this guy. I was like, oh, go ahead, guys, but I'm, I'm going to skip this one. Like, I'm not interested in taking a picture with Liver King. Why the hell would I take a picture with Liver King? What's so special about the Liver King? He's a liar. He's telling the whole world that the nine ancestral tenants are living like this and me. Obviously, the guy's like, why would I praise a liar? Why would I take a picture with this man? I was like, guys, I have nothing. I have no reason to take a picture with him. Like, I would say hello to him. If he said hello to him, I would say hi. I wouldn't treat him like a... I wouldn't treat him like he's subhuman, but I definitely don't look up to the guy. I don't admire the guy whatsoever. Sleeping on a wooden board. Ooh. Wow. Wow. Liver King. Wow, man. That's bad. Nobody ever thought of this. Nonsense, guys. The guy probably sleeps under silk sheets. He probably sleeps in the biggest, softest bed you've ever seen. The guy is a corner cutter. He's weak, guys. If you want to hear my opinion, I think he's weak. He's mentally weak. He can't go out there and make a difference without cheating and lying. He's weak. He's a liar, guys. That's not a virtue. That's a vice. You know what's hard? You know what makes you hard? Not sleeping on a little piece of wood and telling the whole world about it. No. Doing things the right way and achieving your goals. Doing them the old-fashioned, honest way. The authentic way. That's tough. That's having balls. Not eating testicles, telling people you're so... Yeah, you're putting all those testicles <laughs> in your mouth. Oh, look how buff I am. He's a liar and a cheat. He's a liar and a cheat. I have very little respect for him. 15K a month is nothing for a $100 million Liver King. I don't know where you got 15K a month, but Liver King spends 15K a month on roids. From what I heard, that's from Tennis Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, I heard it. It was like around there. Yeah, it's a lot of steroids, guys. I remember I listened to the More Dates, More Plates. Uh, <laughs> video and they were describing the amount of t testosterone and hgh he takes guys that's an absurd amount 
absurd. The guy could die at any moment. The guy could have incredible health issues that we don't know about. If they tell me tomorrow he croaked, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. He was talking about quadrupling his toes. Quadrupling. I, the, the guy's insane. I enjoyed your old cartwheel vid for five years old. Can you release more videos about how to train four to seven year olds in BJJ slash wrestling? That's from Nas. Yeah, that was a great video. I thought of how to teach a young child to do a cartwheel. Um, but unfortunately, I, I, my kids are grow well. My kids are older now. I have a younger daughter. Maybe I'll put her in a video or something. But right now, I'm not really focused on that so much. Coach, now you talked about people. Okay, I did that one. The path to paradise is paved with hell. That's from Rich Finaldi. Quite true. Quite true in many ways. Coach, now you've talked about... Okay, I did that one. If you are on steroids or cheating in any way, that gives you the edge, not naturally. Be honest and compete with guys on steroids. That's from Sahil Sai. I totally agree with that. I think that makes total sense. If you're on steroids, be open about it. Tell the world, yeah, I'm on steroids. Guys, I take steroids and... So what? I take steroids. That's what I do, etc. So I'm on steroids. Big deal. That, those guys, I have respect for them. I have nothing but respect for them. Okay, I, I totally... I have so many guys I've trained with. They tell me, oh, I'm on steroids. Yeah, I do this, I do that. And they're open about it. I don't judge them. I just, you know, worry about their health. I hope nothing bad happens to them in terms of health. Okay, what else we got here? We got here. How do you feel about the light heavyweight fight going to a draw? That's from Tennis Jiu-Jitsu. Tennis Jiu-Jitsu. I went on a whole rant about that. The early parts of the video is always on subject. Okay, so we did Liver King. Then we talked about Ankalaev. I thought he got robbed. I thought he won that fight. I thought Pimblet should have lost. I thought Jared Gordon won that fight. I thought he put on a brilliant performance. And uh, I think that judging is just horrible that night. Really, really one of the worst nights ever. One of the worst. Uh, what else we got here? Do you like Taylor Swift? That's from Sunrise over Biza. Sunrise, I don't want to blow your mind, okay? I don't want to blow your mind. But I don't know who Taylor Swift is. Let me Google. As hip as the coach is, and I know it's not hip to say hip. <laughs> Taylor, Guys, <laughs> I typed in T-A-Y-L-O-T. I put a, I, 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 I punched in a typo, okay? I, was, I had the mic between me and the keyboard. And the name Taylor Swift came up. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Addison Swift. Is an American singer-songwriter. Her disc discography s spans multiple genres. Okay, she's a pop star. All-time artist. Time 100. Okay, she's a, she's a megastar. What about her? Coach, have you ever heard of about, let me look this up before I say it on the air. I hope it's nothing nasty. What is this thing? What is it? What is mewing? The basic idea behind mewing is that you can change the shape of your jaw if you think about the places of your tongue in your mouth. People also claim that it can help sleep apnea. S sinusitis and other conditions guys can I just say something there's truth to this and there's studies on this when you sleep gentlemen and I, should, I know I'm not doing a good example now because my nose is blocked you should always breathe through your nose when you sleep you should sleep with your mouth closed why they did an experiment on chips on monkeys they blocked their noses okay they put silicone in their noses their noses were blocked the monkeys had to breathe from their mouth. And then they compared the monkey's face to monkeys who breathe from their nose. There were physical changes. Why? Because when you breathe from your mouth and your mouth is open, your tongue is not pressing against your teeth. So when your children's face are developing and they breathe through their nose, their tongue is resting on the back of their mouth. Their mouth's their jaws protrude forward, which is a good thing. It gives you this sexy protruding face. You don't want a flat face. Okay? There is actual studies on this, guys. There's research. I know about this. I've studied this, and nose breathing is very important. I've said this on the channel quite many times. 
Believe it or not, I've bought my children straps where they put on their chin like this. Because you don't want to put tape. Some people solve the problem by putting tape. The thing is, tape can get stuck and you can kind of suffocate. You can panic because your nose is not opening. So then when you're reaching for the tape in the middle of your sleep. Some people say put medical tape because it's easier to take off. Very easy. Actually, if you part your lips, it'll open. So you won't. But better than that, you buy a chin strap. You can buy it on Amazon for 10 bucks. It's kind of like elastic. If you need to breathe from your mouth, you just open your mouth. You just the band will hold your mouth closed, but it won't stop your mouth. It's not a it's not a it's not a leather strap. Okay, don't get excited. It's not a leather strap. It's, it has flexibility, so you can just open your mouth and breathe. Okay, now if I close my mouth right now and I start breathing, my nose will open up. My nose is clogged right now, but as I go to bed, I will unlock my nose. Just by closing my lips and breathing very slowly in and out, very slowly, and it might take a minute or two, but my sinuses will unclog, will unlock. Right now, they're, they're locked right now because I'm a little bit sick. And I can't take the time to stop talking and go through this breathing exercise. Okay, but if you close your mouth, you're going to have a little bit, very small air, amount of air going in and out. Even though your nose sinuses are closed, it will eventually open up. Your, your body will not let you die, okay? Your body will not. No matter how much psychologically you think you're going to die, stick with it. Eventually, your nose will open up. The brain has a reflex. It will unlock your sinuses. Guys, there's a whole books written on this. Now, mewing might be pseudoscience because they're claiming maybe other exercises. I didn't read it fully. But there is definitely science behind breathing from your nose, closing your mouth while you sleep, and the structure of your face. You will have a more attractive face. That's why it's very important that your children sleep with their nose uh, excuse me, with their mouth closed and breathe through their nose in the middle of the night, it'll change the shape of their face. Hey coach, big fan. I'm very grateful for your teachings. I consider you one of the top three influential people in my life. That's from Paul Padro. Paul, you're a gentleman and a scholar. I really appreciate those comments. It's very sweet of you. And I'm happy to hear that uh, you're enjoying the channel and I've been making a difference in your life. Thank you for saying that. We Women need love. Men need respect, true or false. That's from Jacob Norman Normore. Now I will tell you it's untrue. Men and women need love and respect. Both all human beings need love and respect. Love and respect are very important. If I had to choose one of the two, it's a tough one. That's a tough one. I don't know. I think I would say maybe they're equally important. Respect is very important because it's kind of hard to love somebody you don't respect. I think I think it's possible. Like, you know, if you, let's say you had a child who's on drugs and doing all sorts of bad things, you might love him. But still, you don't really respect his character. He's a bad person. But since you know him since he's young, he kind of pulls on your heartstrings, etc. So I could see that, but difficult. I have a sinus right now to coach. Thanks a lot. That's from Zane. Zane, learn to breathe from your nose. Very important stuff. Uh, did I miss a super chat? Somebody's saying I miss a super chat. Who would win an MMA fight? Stephen Thompson or Simon Marcus? I think Thompson is the ideal matchup for Simon because he won't go for takedowns. Simon Marcus. I'm not familiar with that fighter. He must be. Okay, Simon Marcus is... Oh, okay, no, it's the, the new glory fighter, I believe. He's coming into MMA. He hasn't fought MMA yet. Am I correct? Simon Marcus, Canadian Muay Thai fighter. Okay, no. Uh, he's currently signed with Unified MMA. Okay, that's why I don't know him. Formerly signed with Glory. Okay, he's a Glory fighter. I think I've seen him in Glory. His name didn't ring a bell, but um, I have, I'm have. i not recalling his fighting style. Very difficult to say. Look, if there's low kicks allowed and it's in a ring, Thai fighting is going to have a much better chance. However, it's in octagon. There's no corners, so you can't really cut him off. Wonder Boy might do extremely well. Uh, but again, I have to see the guy. Wonder Boy is one of my favorite strikers of all time, so um, I, I I favor him. I favor him heavily. Wanted to ask you if you're offer any discounts for Strong and Stable Knees program currently. I'm currently recovering from ACL reconstruction surgery, and bills are crazy. Ha ha! I hope to visit TriStar one day. Paul, my man, type in the promo code Holiday Fifty off if you go to. JujiClub.com, it's right up there. It tells you. You get 50% off right now on the holiday season. 50% off, my friend. Get it. All right? And fix those knees. No more ACL tears, guys. No more. Every time my students hurt their knee, I tell them that's the last one. You get on the program and that's the last injury. The last. 
I know those hospital bills are piling up, but it's also your health. I don't want to give you the scary, scary statistics, but you can injure your knee two years later. On average, people tear the second knee, unfortunately. So get wise. I live in Ottawa. What are your top martial arts gyms in Ottawa? I used to go to Tina Takashi Dojo for a year. I want to go to TriStar. It's only two hours away. Is it possible for me to go to TriStar? Hassan Haytham, of course. It's possible. Many people drive up weekly from Ottawa to train at TriStar Gym. It's kind of like a thing. You're not far away. People come twice a week to TriStar from Ottawa. Um, there's a lot of good gyms out there. I'm just forgetting the names right now, unfortunately. But I will make a note of it for next time to try to remember. Hey, Coach, big fan. I'm very grateful. For oh, thank you. I read that one. Any other super chats I missed? <laughs> hey coach the strongest stable hips coming soon that's from Floyd oh um in the maybe 2023 yes I would say that will come out uh coach your views on the Alberta sovereignty bill I haven't looked into it unfortunately don't know anything about it you missed 20 dollars super chat coach by Zaid oh boy I hate when I do that uh guys slow down on the super chats please I hate when I miss people put money and I miss their super chats. Okay, here we go. Zaid. Salam, Firas. I'm having trouble understanding free will in Islam if Allah created everything. Does that mean our thoughts and actions were created by Him? How can we have free will if our thoughts and actions are created? Guys, I've answered this question too many times. I can't do it today. I have to kind of grandfather this question for like six months. Okay? I've done this question many, many times. Please refer back to... Uh, the old AMAs. I've talked about it too many times. Okay. Great question. Look up pre-established harmony by Leibniz. Pre-established harmony and or occasionalism by Al-Ashari. I'm not going to go into it today, but look up occasionalism. That's one possibility. Or pre-established harmony. I'm not going to be going into it today because I've done it one too many times. Waiting for a program do you recommend for a 31-year-old beginner? Strong and stable. Uh, not as strong and stable, excuse me. Advanced Basics, Volume 1 to 10. Go to jujiclub.com, guys. Advanced Basics, start with Volume 1, then Volume 2. Uh, if you're doing MMA, and then pick up maybe um, a professional kicking or uh, fundamental combinations. I got lots of content for you. And I would pick up strong and stable knees, man. Don't let your knees give out on you, okay? Especially if you're a little older. 31 years old, make sure you're doing the strong and stable knee program. There's a PDF that gives you how to cycle your training, how to do reps and sets. It's all in there. I did a whole PDF. Okay, so when you go in the video, you look underneath the video, it says PDF guide. Click on it. Read it. It's going to take you 30, 40 minutes to read it. I made it really concise. It's going to be so clear, so simple. Your students from Ottawa, do they stay, <laughs> stay at the dorm or just book an Airbnb? I like to stay at the dorms. I would pay for the entire year in advance. Yes, brother. Some stay at the dorms. Some get a hotel. There's a Ruby Foos Hotel. Check out TS Dorms. It's in the description. Go down in the description. TSDorms at gmail.com. Write them. Tell them you want to come in for a weekend or a week. They'll give you the rates. Check it out. There's a dorms. Try Star Dorms. Yes. Okay, guys. What time is it now? What time am I at here? Oh, an hour and 39 minutes. We did it. It's midnight. All right, guys. Let's end it up. <laughs> let's end this one on a on a good note. Coach, thoughts on James Cross situations? That's from to Toady. I heard. Yeah, I heard he did something with gambling. Guys, uh, you, you can't cheat the system. I think it's totally wrong. Um, I like James Cross. I think he's a great coach, great fighter, great. He's always been great with me. Great, super, super good with me. Positive with me. I've never had a single problem with him. I think he's a great, great mind in, in fighting and MMA. I have utmost respect for him. But I don't think, I, I don't know the details of what happened. So I don't want to say he's in the wrong. I don't know. I just heard there was a gambling thing, kind of like insider information. I don't know what it must be. I don't want to, I don't want to say anything <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Okay. But I don't know what it is, but I heard he got in trouble for it. So I don't know the details. Actually, I, I shouldn't make any comment at all. I really don't know the details. Uh, what else we got here? Hassan Haytham. I'll make it for you, brother. I'll make it for you free. Just pay the dorms. The training is free. You're a member in the chat room. Call us. You're free. Yalla, ahlan, wa sahlan. 
Coach, I'm coming to Montreal from Saskatoon. Would love to meet you. What time are you in the gym? That's from Marco V. Marco, I'm in the gym twice a day every day. You can't miss me. Just come to the MMA practice or the BJJ practice. I'm there. Uh, what else we got here, guys? Give me a fun one. My super chat was, what's with Canada and euthanasia? Sounds horrible. Port Film Co-op. Well, I don't know if they have euthanasia. I think we have assisted death. I don't think we have euthanasia. I'm not sure about euthanasia. I don't think so. I think it's assistant death. Like if you have a stage four cancer and you're old, they take you to a certain place and they'll give you a cocktail that'll put you kind of under and you won't suffer from the pain. And then you kind of like die naturally. Um, guys, I'm not an expert in this topic, so please don't don't take take it with a grain of salt what I just said. That's my understanding of what they do. Okay. Um, hey coach, personality tests on your fighters. Do you use personality tests on your fighters? That's on Floyd. No, I do not. That is euthanasia, assisted death. That's from Jacob. Well, <laughs> then I guess that's euthanasia. I don't know exactly what the difference is, but I don't think we call it, I don't think they refer to, I guess I'm not an expert in this topic, so please forgive me. Coach and fighters aren't allowed to bet on fights anymore. That's from Sean Kovarek. Well, you know, I don't think you should bet on fights, but if you're betting on yourself, I don't see how that can go against the rules. That's my only uh, question. Like, if I'm betting on myself, <laughs> I'm obviously trying to win. I, I I understand betting against yourself doesn't make any sense because you're in control of the, your performance. Um, but betting on yourself, well, how does that make any sense? How's that? Why would that be illegal? Coach, I'm a fresh BJJ blue belt trying to develop the, a, a game, but I feel lost. I feel lost a lot in terms of what to do. Is there a training approach you'd recommend, like developing a sequence? That's from Sunrise. Sunrise, I recommend mastering the basics if you're a blue belt. Master the basics. Too many times we learn fancy stuff. I think that's important, but not if you have weak basics. Strong basics are the most important. Ryan Yahya and Crackdown Position. That's from Tom Green. Uh, yeah, I've seen him use it. He does it fantastically. He's one of my favorite grapplers. Uh, Yahya is a genius grappler. I absolutely love watching him. Slam for us, how to, how to have a good mindset when training camp, training for competition. Coach, would love to hear your insight. That's from Hoosie. Hoosie, everything comes your way, turn it into a positive. If you hurt your hand, find a way that it's going to help you do your grappling or your elbows or your knees or your kicks. I'm not sure what type of fighting. Everything is a positive, no matter what happens. You're a pound overweight. Well, that means I'm going to be on weight for a shorter period of time. Therefore, I'm going to have more energy on fight nights. Get in that positive mind thinking. Even though... It might not be accurate. You're seeing everything as good for your fight. Why? Because when you're going to go on fight night, you're going to feel like you can do it. And you're going to have given yourself every chance to make it happen. You know, it's all about having a positive narrative. Now, don't go against science or logic. Okay. But everything that's interpretable, that's not objective, spin it in a good way. Keep the mind positive. <laughs> Coach, is Kimura considered a basic move or advanced one? That's from AMS. I would say it's basic, but it can't be taught to the level of advanced. But you should definitely learn it in the basics. Absolutely. But of course, there are levels to Kimura. Coach, any advice on introverts like me? I don't even want to go to the gym because I don't want to be surrounded by many people. That's from OK. All right, guys. That's going to be the last one. Please, no more super chats. That's going to be the last one. And I'm going to wrap this up because it's bedtime. Guys, if you're an introvert and you want to go to the gym, but you feel like you don't want to be around anybody else, it's time to take a step towards that. Maybe you're petrified about being surrounded by people. Make a goal. Look, I'm going to go into the gym and I'm going to spend 15 minutes in the gym. I'm going to do a dumbbell routine and leave. It's going to be 15 minutes. I have a timer on my watch. I'm going to do 15 minutes. I'm going to do that three times a week. When it becomes easy, do 30 minutes. When it becomes easy, do 45 minutes. When that becomes easy, join a boxing club. When that becomes easy, join an MMA club. When that becomes easy, join a jiu-jitsu club where people are all over your body. T 
take incremental steps. That's what a courageous human being does. Ask yourself, is it logical that I'm scared of other people? It's illogical. If you have an irrational belief, and if you're not sure if it's logical or not, ask people around you. Ask somebody you trust. Am I being irrational? Am I being irrational, I should say? Ask somebody you have respect for that you find that their mind is... They have a healthy, strong, and, and, and intelligent mind. Ask them their opinion. And if they tell you, look, I don't think it's good for you. I think you should be in the gym. I think you should take care of Then the decision has been made. Now it's time to incrementally step in that direction. Incrementally. Not go necessarily from hot to cold. Very few, very few people have success like that. Most people, it will end up backfiring. However, take the step towards that goal. And that is the only way to live. There is no other way. Every other way of life is a thousand deaths. A coward dies a thousand deaths. Uh, Shakespeare said it well. A coward dies a thousand deaths. Every time you miss going to the gym, you die a little death. And you die a little death again. You're missing out on opportunity. You're missing out on developing your potential. You're going to look back and say, what if I faced my fears? Guys, learn to love the pain. When I have something, when I do something I don't like, I tell myself I love the pain. I love this pain. I know there's a reward on the other side. You start to think this way. You will never regret thinking this way. You will never. Even when you fall and you break a bone, you will not regret it. Because when that bone heals, you'll have a nice story to tell, but also you've gotten tougher. You don't want to live in a plastic bag, my friends. You don't want to live on a silk pillow. You know, if I had $100 million in my bank account, I would still go to practice. I would still break my bones. I don't want to live. You know, it's it's incredible to me how people are all trying to get rich because they want to live on a silk pillow. If you were my little brother and you lived on a silk pillow, I hate to say it, but I, I'd walk up to you and I'd slap you. And I'd tear you off that sick silk, silk pillow and I'd throw you out in the street in the cold. I'd want you to become a man. If you were my son and you were sil sleeping on a silk pillow, with your servants around you, fanning you and feeding you grapes, I'd slap you. I'd knock you off your little throne. I'd chuck you out into the cold. And I know in the future you will thank me for this. Because living on a silk pillow is hell. It's hell. But you don't see it. It's hell because your mind is so filled with horrible things. Dreams people put in your head. Sitting around satisfying your base desires, guys, leads to hell. Leads to a horrible state, psychologically, physically, spiritually. Go out in the world and have your adventure. Break some bones. Get some scars. I'm saying don't, don't, don't damage your health, but stay within. Stay within what's rational, but go out there and have your adventures. Try Fail, succeed, fail, succeed. Go through that roller coaster. Go through the roller coaster of life. Up, down. Find out who your friends are. Let me tell you something. If you live on a silk pillow, you'll never have a real friend. You'll always wonder, hey, are these people my friends because I can offer them silk pillows? You'll never have a real friend. You'll never understand who's there with you when it's, the chips are down, when t life is tough. Who's there with you only when times are good? You'll never have these very uh, intrinsic experiences that are worth more than any fancy lifestyle. That's why I always kind of scoff when people show on their Instagram how rich they are. Guys, that's so, that's so pathetic. It is the word, guys, to use. And the worst is, there's so many of you out there praise them for it. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Wow, oh, you guys out there, oh, you have a boat like this and you have a house like that. Look, I understand the luxuries. I understand it's nice. Like, I've been the guest of a king. I've been the guest of really rich people and I understand the luxuries are nice. I, I get it. But you can't make your life go this. You can't make your whole... And I, I don't want to knock anybody. If you live in a mansion, good for you. I have no, I'm not judging you. As long as you're still going out there 
and making a difference in the world, challenging yourself, growing as a human being. I have no nothing negative to say. Now, me personally, as a as a human being, I've renounced luxury. Like I personally will never live in the lap of luxury. Personally, I never want to live this way. If I ever bought a, a property, it's because it's a it's a financially smart decision. I'm trying to collect real estate. I'm trying to do something to hand down intergenerational wealth. Okay, that in that way, I would see it's a good way to secure our wealth. Yeah, okay, I would do it. Am I going to sleep on a silk pillow? Never. Am I going to have somebody feed me grapes? Never. Will I live in the lap of luxury? Never. Never. If I was a gazillionaire, I'd still buy used cars. I'd still <laughs> shop the cheapest clothes. I'd still, I wouldn't be a miser. I would I would be, you know, I'd use my money for good. Like I'd, I'd help people. That would be my goal. But I wouldn't be caught dead wearing Louis Vuitton. Now, if you wear Louis Vuitton, guys, don't think it's an attack. But I find it highly unappealing. The only way I would ever wear something like that, like a Louis Vuitton or Gucci or whatever, is if somebody gave it to me as a gift. That's the only way. I wouldn't want to insult that person, so I would wear it. But any other any other time, you'll never see me trade money for something because it has the word Gucci on it, or or, or whatever. I don't even know the the labels, but I find that to be um, unappealing. And it's sad for me to see that so many people, all they do for a living is have. Oh, I, I inherited all this wealth and I have millions of followers and I have this great influence. Why? My daddy was rich and he handed it down to me. How is that? How is that something to admire? I think personally, most of those people have deep insecurities. That's why they have to keep showing you their luxuries. Why? They have nothing else to show you. They have nothing else. They have nothing intelligent to type or interesting. They have nothing appealing about them other than they could say, look, look at this one of a kind bag. I paid... 100 million gazillion dollars for it. Doesn't that tickle your brain? You can barely pay your rent this month. Look how much I spent on these shoes. Don't get me started on NFTs. Oh, look, I bought this NFT for a bazillion dollars. What the hell is that? You're either cleaning money or you're just trying to flex. You have so much wealth that you're willing to spend on this crypto kitty, on this crypto punk. Guys, if you gave me all the crypto punks in all the world, I wouldn't want them. I would delete. I would oh, this is taking up space on my hard drive. I would be like, right click, delete. Oh, this art. I need art, man. That's just junk on my hard drive. I don't want it. Yet, if somebody bought it for a million gazillion dollars, other people want it now. And it's a type of group think. It's a, it's a mind virus. That's what it is. I see it as a mind virus. Now, I have no problem. Look, if you're rich and you earned your money or you even inherit it and you have a you have a good, nice house and you have a pool and you have a fancy car and you enjoy those things, I have no criticism of you. I have none. I just personally don't want to live that way. I personally don't want to live. And I think you can have an exciting and, and, and adventurous life. You can have, you can reach goals. You can develop. It's all about improvement. I want to improve myself. People, when they're rich, they get lazy. So money could be a curse. Now, if you wake up in the morning, you're like, hey, man, I'm not going to rent, make the rent this month. Man, I'm not going to make it. You're going to start thinking all sorts of ways to make money. You're going to start to hustle. You're going to have that fire in you. Let me tell you something. Having that fire in you, having that drive, it's it's tough. It's anxiety. It's pain. But also, in so many ways, it's pleasure. Oh, once you reach your goal, man. You appreciate your life. You appreciate these things. We started from the bottom. Now we're here. Oh, now being here is so good. Because we remember where we were. Oh, it was so bad. Oh, now we appreciate life. And then you see somebody else struggling and you you feel for them. You're like, oh, they're in that struggle. Let me see if I can help them. Let me see. I know that pain. I know that. I've been there. I have a understanding. I have a connection with this other person. I see somebody on the other side of the world. They're hungry. They're starving. I feel for them. I understand them. Other people that are born in a lap of luxury, they have no connection. Guys, I've, I've met really rich people that were born in a lap of luxury. They see a hungry person. They, they don't, to them, it does, it's... I don't even know what that is. It's like you show them a picture of a cartoon. They don't, they don't understand. They have no connection with the real world around them. They have no connection whatsoever. They have no understanding of how the world works. And it's a sad type of poverty. It's a psychological, intellectual, experimental type of poverty. They haven't experienced these rich um, 
this rich type of enlightenment. Now, I don't mean this as a criticism, guys. I really hope you guys don't take it that way because I know a lot of you listening to this are rich. All I'm saying is if you're rich, find the goal and improve. Guys, and Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What's the top, top need? Self-actualization. Self-actualization means self-improvement. You're, you're constantly, one of the greatest human feelings, most positive feelings you could ever have is when you've improved. If you're stronger than yesterday, if you're smarter than yesterday, if you're more sophisticated than yesterday, if you're more creative than yesterday, you have an intrinsic feeling of well-being. Now, later on, he rewrote his uh, hierarchy of needs and he added self-transcendence. We'll talk about that another day. But however, self-actualization is extremely important. You can't do that if you're living um, in your comfort zone. Learn to, guys, learn to strive, learn to have goals, learn to reach. You'll have fill, you will fulfill a much greater, um, you'll have a much greater level of happiness. Guys, check out lighthouse.world, my boy. Joe made, he did, he did it, man. He's the Google of the metaverse. Check it out, guys. They raised 7 million. These guys are going to tear up the whole metaverse. Check them out, lighthouse.com. Make your accounts now. In the future, they might be worth something. Who knows? Guys, thank you for tuning in. I'm really appreciative. I hope you guys like, share, and comment, and I'll see you all in the next episode. Thank you.